Hey, Pastor Jeremy here. Thanks so much for checking us out again and seeing what God has put on our hearts to share with you today. Before we get started, I just want to remind you, if you want to continue on and following our ministry, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and then also share it with with as many people as possible. You can also follow us on on Facebook and also on our website at fbcac.org, where we're trying to put out as much content as possible to feed you, to fill you, as you want to become more like Jesus and glorify God with every aspect of your life. Now, we're about to get into the Word of God, so sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee, and I hope you enjoy our, and are edified by the Word of God proclaimed. God bless you, and we love you. It can be awkward, um, and like we talked about last week, one of the reasons why it's awkward is because it's not natural, right? It's a spiritual thing. And so if you try to engage in something spiritual, but you're a fleshly person or you're not, you're, you're not growing in the spirit, trying to take on a spiritual act, is very, it feels very foreign. It feels very awkward. And so today we're going to talk about the hard aspect of prayer. We're, we're going to talk about um, the difficulties of, of prayer and, and, and why prayer is so difficult, but even more so how not to pray. We're going we're gonna to talk about what we shouldn't be doing when we're praying. Like I mentioned last week, um, sometimes we think prayer is so personal that you can't rightfully say, hey, don't pray this way. Hey, you can't pray this way, right? We don't like hearing that. We think that we can just pray however we want um, because we're just talking to God. It's just me and God, so I can do whatever I want. Well, Jesus would actually probably disagree with that um, perspective, which we're going to see here in today's scripture. Um, if you want to kind of get prepared and ahead of me, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 6. The verses are in the handout, and that's kind of where we're going to focus our time on today. Have you guys ever um, seen, do you guys remember the show, Kids Say the Darndest Things? You guys remember that show? I think it was hosted by like uh, Bill Cosby at Alan, first. Alan, Alan, Alan who? Alan Funt. That was way before my days, brother. I think I, I think I picked. Yeah, well, hey, hey, generations, right? Okay. <laughs> I think I picked it up uh, when uh, Bill Cosby. I think. Okay, good. I'm, I'm starting to remember. Um, the reason why that show was so funny was not because the kids were trying to be funny. They were just being honest, right? They just said the things that they, that they said that came to their mind. They were just being honest. They were just being forthright. They didn't have the filters that we as adults are supposed to have, apparently, uh, nowadays. Some of us have missed that memo, but that's okay. Um, but I think it's why God calls us to come to him with childlike faith, right? Why? Because children will come to God with ridiculous prayers, but with confidence. Just like I can talk to God and I can ask him for anything because he's my father. That's actually a great perspective to have when we pray, right? Um, and so if you don't know what I'm talking about regarding some, some, some kids' prayers and, and how innocent and silly they can be, um, let me give you some examples. Jimmy, <clears throat> a six-year-old boy, once prayed, God, who did you make smarter, boys or girls? Because my sister and I want to know. <laughs> I've prayed that prayer before. I didn't like the answer that I got. Uh, Angela, uh, age eight. Once prayed, dear God, could you please give my brother some more brains? Because it seems apparently he doesn't have any yet. Uh, that was Angela's prayer. Hank, at the age of seven, once prayed, dear Lord, uh, thank you for the nice day today. It seems you fooled the TV weatherman once again, right? Uh, which apparently doesn't take much to do, um, because I don't think they're ever right. Uh, that's just my opinion. Agnes, the age of six, once prayed, dear God, please bring me a new brother, because the one I got punches me all the time. Uh, some of you girls can relate, maybe, if you've had a brother. David, when he was seven years old, uh, you can figure out which David. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, once prayed, dear God, I need, a raise, I need a raise in my allowance, please. Uh, could you please tell your angels to tell my parents, right? Apparently, that was God's decision to raise his allowance. And then this is my favorite. Debbie, seven-year-old Debbie, once prayed, dear God, please send me a new baby, because the one you sent last week cries way too much. Right. I wish it were that easy. Parents, you probably wish it was that easy, too, sometimes. Um, now, the honesty and the forthrightness and the boldness that these children showed in their prayers should actually characterize 
our prayer lives, right? But it doesn't take a theologian to know that their, their prayers actually missed the point, right? They were a little bit misguided, even though we don't want to break their little hearts. I hope we don't tell them that, not just yet at least. Um, you see, through this series on prayer, we're going to learn the qualities and the characteristics of a healthy and effective and empowering prayer life that will actually strengthen our walk with Jesus. If you've ever felt dry, and this is a huge conviction for me because I feel dry in my faith uh, commonly, not regularly, but it's a common thing in my experience to just kind of feel dry in my walk, prayer has actually proven to be the thing that fires me up again. And I want to offer that to you today. And so today we're going to look at a general posture of prayer that we should actually avoid at all costs as we uh, live out our faith in Jesus. You see, there's absolutely a wrong way to pray. And don't take my word for it. Please, like, this isn't my opinion. We're going to look at Jesus's statements on this, okay? So in Matthew's gospel, uh, we are given kind of right at the very beginning of the gospel. In the first couple chapters, we're given Jesus's first major sermon, right? That, that is found in scripture um, which is probably his most popular sermon. We all know it. It's called the Sermon on the Mount, right? I'm sure you've all memorized the sermon from beginning to end. Say amen. Okay. Maybe not. I'm in the wrong church. But that's okay. Um, I haven't memorized it either. So, I, But I think this has become Jesus' most powerful teaching because of the things that he talks about, because he acknowledges and he addresses a wide variety of issues that are so practical, they're so familiar to us today, but he doesn't look at the outward appearance. He doesn't look at the actions themselves. What does he look at? He looks at the heart. Everything having to do with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount has to do with issues of the heart, matters of the heart. You see, Christianity is not about behavior modification. This is not about acting good and being good in order to prove that you've arrived or that, God, I'm worthy to go to heaven or see everybody, I'm a good person, I'm not like I used to be. That's not what Christianity is about. Christianity, first and foremost, is a heart change. It involves a heart change. Following Jesus begins with heart surgery. We must go through that painful experience that can last a long time for some, for many, maybe even for most, to change our hearts in which the Holy Spirit, he actually removes your hardened heart, your wicked heart, your sinful heart. I don't know if you knew that you had a hardened, wicked, sinful heart towards God before you met Jesus, but you did, right? But you did. We all did. We all fall short of the glory of God. And so what the Holy Spirit does is he removes that heart of stone and he replaces it with a heart of flesh that is sensitive, that is responsive to the word of God and to the spirit of God. So you can try to, to work your way to being a good person as you want. Be my guest, but you won't make it because it doesn't exist. It's not until your heart changes that you begin to have renewed desires. Like, I'm sure you've experienced, like, man, the things I want now have nothing to do with what I used to want. Isn't that weird sometimes? Like, I used to like this, and now it disgusts me. That's not you being a holy roller. That's not you being holier than thou. That's you being regenerated through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, we're all guilty of trying to qualify or justify sin. We all do it, all right? We need to get on the same page and say, yeah. I am guilty of that. I will try to qualify or justify my sin. Well, everybody else is doing it, right? We've been there before. Well, that's just the way I am. It's human nature, right? We've all said that before. I just made a, a bad judgment call. I erred, but hey, I'm human, right? How can, you, how can you knock me for that? Well, early on in the sermon, Jesus says um, certain things about the heart, right? We all say that we all have a right to get angry. Like angry, anger is a natural thing <clears throat> in the human experience. We've all, has anybody never gotten angry? I think even Ella's probably gotten angry before. 
Tammy's probably never gotten angry except when she's around Glenn, so we won't go there. Um, I just ruffled some feathers, apparently. But we've all experienced anger, and, and we probably think, well, it's just natural. But here's what Jesus says about anger. He says, if, you're, if you have anger in your heart, you're as guilty as the murderer. And you're actually liable to the same judgment that the murderer is. That's what Jesus says. That's kind of a tough standard to live by. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says in his letter to the church, what does he say? Man's anger does not produce the righteousness of God. So if you've ever been angry more than like two seconds, you've probably sinned in your anger. Because the Bible says, be angry, just don't sin in it. Well, how do we do that, right? That's impossible for us to not sin in our anger. So right off the bat, we're all guilty as charged. We're all liable to the same judgment as the murderer. Now, that's pretty tough to deal with. Or maybe we try to chalk it up to human nature. Well, it's totally natural to think and feel how I think and feel. That's the way God made me, right? We hear that all the time, yeah? I might look at another woman or another man with lust in my eyes, but that's, that's, that's how God made me, right? It's it's just it's just magazines, it's just videos, it's just pictures, right? It's I'm not gonna do anything with that man or with that woman. It's not like I'm cheating on my spouse. But Jesus doesn't stop with the anger issue. What does he say? He continues on and says that even if you've lusted after a person with your eyes, you're guilty of what? Adultery. Man, Jesus, you're laying it on thick, dude. So if it's your eye that causes you to sin, what does he tell you to do? Cut it out. Get it out. Why? Because it's better that you enter into heaven missing an eye than having your whole body thrown into hell. That's the word of our Lord. Apparently, Jesus was not playing around. So he continues to address certain issues, okay? And he looks at every single issue as a matter of the heart, not the action which is most of us will look at the action and judge the action. Jesus says, no, I'm looking at the heart, right? And in chapter six, he begins to address a particularly devious and damaging heart issue of fake righteousness and piety. I'm not sure which is more divisive as I was trying to think about this. Uh, what is more divisive in the body of Christ? Is it, a, is it someone who claims to be a Christian, but then does not live at, like it at all and is not ashamed to to be that disobedient like they're not trying to to paint the picture but they call themselves a christian or is it the person who puts on the holy act who who puts on the mask when they walk through the doors on a sunday morning but then every other day of the week they're not living like that you know they're, they're trying to be fake with their christianity i'm trying to figure out which is more divisive in the church and destructive. And so in this section of, of the sermon, Jesus actually begins to address this very issue, right? And according to Jesus's words, it seems that Jesus would say the latter is the most destructive. It's the fake. It's the hypocrite. It's the fake Christian in our context, the one who puts on an act simply to impress others, okay? So in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, Jesus says this, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. So why are they practicing righteousness? So they can be seen by other people. He says, for then you will have no reward from your father who is in heaven. Wow. When we engage in any act of righteousness, when we do anything good, I think it's good for us to ask ourselves, why am I doing this? Why am I doing good? Why am I performing an act of righteousness? What is my motivation? And I'm sure we'd all like to say on the surface, oh, I'm doing it all for the glory of God, right? Oh, holy is that is, is me, right? I think we all would like to think we're doing it all for the glory of God. But I want to offer a, a, a heart check that this the Lord kind of gave this to me. And this really convicted me because as I started to look at my motivations, I'm not as pure in my heart as I like to think I am. 
and this is kind of embarrassing to admit. Here's the heart check test. Have you ever been insulted or hurt or, or, um, or offended in any way when you did something nice for someone or you did something good and you didn't get any recognition? You didn't get noticed. You didn't get a thank you. You didn't say, you didn't get a, oh, that just really blessed me. You didn't get anything. Have you ever done that? If you have been there, I want to lovingly offer you the possibility that maybe your motivations are a little off kilter, right? Maybe you're not doing it for pure reasons just to bless them, just to honor God in heaven. Maybe your motivation is actually to gain their recognition or, or, or gain their acceptance or, or gain their uh, love and admiration. As I've been thinking about this principle, again, I've had to take a, a long, hard look at my own life and, and why do I do the things that I do? Am I doing it for recognition? And my mind immediately went to one thing, social media. And you guys know what I'm talking about. It's the, like, the virus, the curse of social media is virtue signaling. You guys know what I'm talking about? Taking pictures of all the good things you do all the time. Like, look at me, I'm doing good. Look at me, I'm, I'm picking up the, I'm picking up the trash in the park. Check this out. <laughs> Click. All right, and I'm posted on Facebook. Right? It's called virtue signaling. It's, it's letting everybody know how virtuous you are. Right? I think I've been guilty of that. I think when, I think if I'm going to be honest, in the past, yeah. I've done when I when I thought I was advertising something good, when I thought I was bringing glory to God, when I thought I was like, hey, follow Jesus. No, what was I doing? Hey, look at me. Can I get a like? Can I get a comment? You know, something like that. Now, doing good is actually a good thing in public. Doing good in public is a good thing. We don't want to knock that. To some extent, it's actually necessary. It's because why? It's a vis it gives a visible tangible example of the goodness of God, of like life with Jesus, uh, of the fact that I've been regenerated and, and we want to point people to Christ. People get uh, uh, encouraged and, ex and exhilarated by seeing people living for Jesus. And so we want to be able to do that. In fact, closer to the beginning of this very sermon, just a few verses before Jesus says this, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So apparently, Jesus thinks that, in, to some extent, it, it's, it's good to do things out in the open. But Jesus then says, do things in secret so that your Father in heaven, who is in secret, will reward you. Like, so now I'm, I'm confused. Is Jesus contradicting himself? Do we have Jesus literally um, talking out of his mouth about what we are supposed to do when it comes to righteousness? Like, Jesus, can you give us the right truth? Can you, can you give us some direction here? Remember, it's not the outward action. The outward action is not the issue. It's the heart and the motivation behind the act. Are you performing good works? for you to post on Facebook or social media to bring glory to God or to bring glory to yourself? That's what we need to ask ourselves. Because Jesus clarifies that those whose motivation is to impress people, they will have their just reward. People will be impressed. But guess what? That's where it stops. They will not receive the reward from their Father who is in heaven, according to Jesus. So Jesus establishes the foundations of a fake and hypocritical heart to then talk about what we're talking about in this series, prayer, okay? And so he's, he, we're now going to talk about Jesus' approach to prayer and how you are not to pray. So in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, we read Jesus' commentary on prayer. Verse 5, he says this, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues, and at the street corners, 
that they may see that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut your door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when do you pray? Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So there's a couple different negative postures of prayer that Jesus addresses in just these verses that we need to understand so that we can really grow our prayer lives by avoiding these two postures. The first posture in your outlines is a posture of boastful prayer. Boastful prayer. Jesus says not to be like the hypocrites when you pray. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners and basically stand on their prayer pedestal and say, look at me. Look how holy I am. I've made it, right? Look at me if you need to know what it means to be holy. The word that is translated as hypocrite is the Greek word in your outlines. It actually looks very much like our English word. It's the Greek word hupokrites, hupokrites. And hupokrites refers to an actor playing a particular role or character, okay? So when Jesus referred to the Pharisees as the hupokrites, what's going to draw in the minds of his listeners are the Greek plays, the dramas and the tragedies, uh, the the Greek actors who would have uh, an assortment of different masks to play varying roles, right? So as they're uh, doing their thing in the play, they would change masks to change characters. That's the, the correlation that Jesus is bringing between um, the, 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 the hypocrite, the hypocrites, and the person who prays in this manner. And so he uses that term to criticize the Pharisees and the religious leaders who were using a good thing like prayer. And even praying in the company of others, in the presence of others, that's a good thing, but what were they doing? They were using it for their own good. They were using it for their own advantage. They were using it for self-centered reasons. Just a couple of verses earlier, Jesus says that they also gave to the needy only to be praised by men. That's all they were doing it for, was for recognition. You see, that's a heart check for us. Why do I do the good things that I do? Am I doing it for recognition or am I doing it simply because I love God and I want to obey him and I want to bless others, whether I get the recognition or not? You see, prayer is first and foremost, it's a spiritual act. It's something that we gauge in between me and God, first and foremost. It's between me and God. So that's why Jesus says that rather than trying to pray for the recognition of others, what should we do? We should go into your room. We should go into our rooms. We should shut the door and we should pray in secret. Well, that's kind of weird, like, right? I mean, we don't normally do that. But I think Jesus is trying to teach a principle here. Now, before you think about praying in public and before you start doing something like that, maybe you should start practicing just me and you, just me and God in secret by myself, right, in the presence of my God. And I think what he's drawing out for us is a key in your outlines. My private prayer life should dictate my public prayer life. My private prayer life should dictate my public prayer life. How I pray in secret and in the privacy of my alone time with God should simply flow out of and flow into how I pray in public. So rather than thinking, I better turn up the passion and the zeal because everybody's listening, I gotta impress people, I gotta make it seem like I'm a real prayer warrior. No, I develop my prayer life first and foremost in my alone time with God. And then when it comes time to pray in public, I just take that into a public space. There is no difference between the two. You see, the hypocritical religious leader's heart and motivation was exposed in their boastful 
prayer life, right? In their boastful approach to prayer. In Luke's gospel, we read a, a, a parable spoken by Jesus that gives us insight into the subject of boastful prayer. What does boastful prayer actually look like? Well, Jesus tells of this parable, and it's in uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 9. If you want to just flip forward a couple books, Luke chapter 18, verse 9, gives us this great story um, and this great teaching about uh, uh, from Jesus about how two different men pray. And we're going to learn a lot about like their posture of prayer and what proper prayer looks like and what improper prayer looks, looks like. So beginning in in Luke chapter 18, verse 9, we read this. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So he's talking to a particular group of people who thought their own righteousness was going to be good enough. And then they looked down on others because they weren't as good as they were, right? And Jesus uses these words. He opens up the parable with this. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. (laughs) If you ever begin a prayer like that, I want to encourage you to stop. Like, don't, don't pray anymore. Or pray that God does not strike you down with lightning at that very moment. Like, don't pray that prayer, right? God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. What a bully, right? What a bully. But isn't it interesting that he uh, he's doing what we do? He justifies our sin, he, or he's justifying his sin like we do. Well, I'm not an extortioner. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not unjust. I'm not like this tax collector, right? I'm this good guy. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, Jesus now switches to the tax collector, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he would beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Notice the the postures of the two men, right? You look at the tax or you look at the Pharisee, he's standing by himself. That's a a huge clue into his posture towards prayer. He's going to separate himself from the crowd. He's probably going to get up on a rock or a pedestal, and he's going to pray by himself so that everybody can see him, everybody can hear him. All eyes are on this guy, right? But look at the posture of the tax collector standing far off. Was too embarrassed to be with the crowd. Maybe hunkered down in the corner. So ashamed and so guilty that he couldn't even, he couldn't even lift his head up to look at God. An amazing posture that we need to embrace when we pray. Notice the words of the two men. Gosh, this Pharisee, talk about full of himself, right? My goodness. Do you have a bad opinion about yourself at all, right? I mean, he just kept going and going of all the things that he did. He's not like everybody else, and this is all, these are all the good things. Like he's trying to convince God. Like he's trying to give a reason to God to bless him. That doesn't make sense. But look at the words of the tax collector. If he spoke English, and he spoke according to the English standard version of the Bible that I have right here, he spoke seven simple words. That was it. God, be merciful. Be merciful to me, a sinner. An amazing posture of prayer. This leads us to the second negative posture of prayer that we need to consider today. Number two in your outlines, we should avoid boastful prayer and we need to avoid vain prayer. Vain prayer. Now you might be thinking those are one and the same. 
but they're not necessarily. Again, back to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7, Jesus says this, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases, uh, whatever that phrase might be in your Bibles. Um, heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. The phrase, heap up empty phrases. Um, some of your Bibles, if you have like the NLT, I think it says babbling on and on. Um, the NIV says it, uh, they keep on babbling, right? And so they just babble, 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 babble. Just keep talking, keep talking. It's like, oh my gosh, like when are you going to finish this prayer, right? <clears throat> it's the one Greek word that actually kind of sounds like a babbling word. It's batalo ego, batalo geo. And it simply means to stammer, or it refers to a stammerer or a stutterer, someone who continually repeats the same thing over and over and over again, right? Just meaningless, empty words and phrases that they may sound spiritual, but it is it has nothing to do with a sincere approach to communicating with God. They basically think the more words I say, the better. And so they just go, 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 go. The Gentiles in that day would often pray the same words, like the same phrases over and over and over again for hours. They would do this. They would repeat the name of their God over and over and over again, almost as if the more they repeat, the more effective their prayers were. Well, let me suggest that word count does not determine the quality of your prayer. How many words you say has nothing to do with the quality of your prayer. We learn that from the tax collector. I remember um, in my Catholic days, if any of you grew up Catholic, you know that uh, in order to get absolved of our sins, we had to do what? We had to go talk to a priest. It's like, oh man, this is so embarrassing, right? And so we'd, I'd go confess to a priest, and then he would give me a penance, and that penance would apparently absolve me of my, my sin. And, and what did the penance consist of? Uh, okay, my son, um, you go do 15 Hail Marys, go do 20 Lord's Prayers, and go do 15 Glory Bees, and then you'll be good for the week or, or, for, or for the day or whatever, right? And so I would go off and I would just repeat these prayers over and over and over again until I got the count right. I'm sorry, but after the first prayer, I, I, I ended up forgetting what I was even saying, right? I was like, combining prayers. I was like, Hail Mary, the, my Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Uh, you know, it's just like, what am I even, I don't even know what I'm praying over at this point. You know, our prayers should never lose meaning. They should never lose that connection to our God. They should never become so filled with many words that we don't even know what we're praying for anymore. Have you ever, I mean, have you ever done that? Like, I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. Uh, I don't even know why I came to God in, in prayer in first place. We're just kind of spouting out words according to Jesus. Though the Pharisee in, in Luke chapter 18 was not exactly stammering, he may not have been stuttering or repeating his vain words, he certainly was using a lot of words to try to sound eloquent, to try to sound like, oh, in the company of others, wait till you hear me pray, right? When we pray in the company, of brothers and sisters. Remember, this is a spiritual act. This is not a fleshly act. We should not be so concerned with the quality of our words. It has nothing to do. There's no power in your prayer unless it's connected to the power of God. Amen? Otherwise, they're just words. They're meaningless words. As we grow in our prayer life, we, we will learn to incorporate God's word. We will become more spiritually mature over time. We'll become more familiar with Scripture. And Scripture can actually drive and direct and, and dictate our prayer life, which is a beautiful thing. Uh, just make sure that you're quoting Scripture accurately when you pray. You don't want to like misquote Scripture, and then that sounds kind of silly. That can be distracting. Um, but we shouldn't be trying to use big and fancy words. Okay, This was a suggestion to me um, many years ago, many years ago, because like the disciples and like we'll look at next week, these guys have been praying all of their lives. But what did they ask Jesus? Jesus, would you please teach us how to pray? And we're going to look at his answer next week. 
but there is this um, implication that although you may have been doing it all your life, don't think you're not above the Lord teaching you how to pray, right? And so I was given some advice because, um, <clears throat> especially coming out of the Catholic Church, at least as far as my experience was, um, prayer outside of saying the Lord's Prayer and the Hail Mary and doing that stuff like before dinner and before you go to bed, like just like just random prayer or just like coming with some, coming along somebody and say, hey, let me pray for you. That was that was foreign. So when I stepped into a different circle like this context, this was very intimidating for me. I didn't like um, doing it. And I remember my first experience of group prayer was at a men's camp out um, up the mountain. And I had to apparently follow Pastor Fred in prayer, which was <laughs> that was unfair. Um, I will take that to my grave. Um, but I was uh, from that experience. I learned this very valuable lesson. <clears throat> Pray as you talk. However you talk, just pray that way. Don't think that you have to like get into this mode and it's like, oh, I just I just followed this 35-year pastor, this guy that like this Pentecostal, like fire and brimstone preacher who now I have got I gotta sound like that. No, just pray as you talk. Pray exactly how you would talk to anybody else. If you have a high school vocabulary, don't try to pray like you have a master's degree in English literature, right? It doesn't, doesn't match up. Um, people will know you, and it's like, you never use that word except when you pray. Why is that? Um, on the other side of the cone, coin, I should say, on the other side of that same coin, however you talk, don't be ashamed to talk like that to God. It's simply communication with our Heavenly Father. You see, too many of us, we all do this. We're so concerned about, I don't want to, I don't want to sound weird. I don't want to sound stupid or silly or uneducated or, or unfamiliar with scripture. Like I'm so conscious of everyone else that I actually will stop myself from just talking with my father who is in heaven. We don't want that either because in all of these circumstances, the focus of prayer has been shifted from God to people. And that misses the point of prayer. We need to focus on God. And so what we're going to do is this. We're actually going to incorporate this practice throughout the rest of this series. Okay, and so I want you guys to just uh, be prepared ahead of hand, ahead of hand and, and just know what's coming over the next uh, several Sundays as we model and as we practice and as we participate in prayer together. We're going to use prayer targets, okay? Or you can call them prayer prompts. You can see these um, as just, uh, we're going to use scripture here to prompt our prayers. Sometimes it's very difficult to even know where to begin. Sometimes it's like, I don't even know how to start or where do I go from here or whatnot. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use scripture as a prompt to prayer. And what I want to encourage you guys in this exercise as we spend this time together is you pray as you feel led. Okay? And I want to encourage you to pray out loud. To let your voice be heard to God. Not to impress each other. Not to say, okay, I got through that. No, I just want to encourage you guys to pray as you feel led because this is just a time that you're spending with your heavenly father. The first verse that we're going to look at is Psalm 139. It's the very end of it. Kim, you opened us uh, you opened up the worship team in Psalm 139 this morning. Well, we're going to close out at the end of it. It's pretty cool. David says this, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. As we begin to pray through this verse and out of this verse, um, I also want to encourage you, if you have your prayer journals with you, I want to, by the way, bring your prayer journals to, to church on Sundays um, because this is a perfect opportunity to start utilizing these um, and start uh, recording your prayers. 
So feel free to do that. Feel free to pray out loud or, or just in the quietness of your own heart as you feel led. All right? So let's pray. Father, we invite you right now in this space to search our hearts. God, would you search my heart? God, sometimes um, sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking that my heart is the true expression of my reality and how I should feel and, and what's going on around me. But Lord, your word says the heart is deceptively wicked. Who can even know it? Lord, I don't know my heart as well as I think I do. There are motivations and there are desires and there are um, um, just feelings within my heart that are simply not of you, that need to be completely destroyed by the power of your Holy Spirit. So, Jesus, would you search my heart right now? And would you start to chip away and eliminate anything that you find offensive to you? I don't care if it's something that I've wanted or something that I've thought on or something that I've felt for months or years. If you don't want it in there, get it out. Please do that so that I can walk with you in, a, in the everlasting life that you have promised every single born-again believer, every single one of us who have been washed by the blood of Jesus. So please look into the depths of my heart and do a work within me that only you can. Deceitfully, 
he will receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Holy Spirit, we need clean hands and a pure heart to be even heard by our Father who is in heaven. And that is a work that only you can do. And so, Holy Spirit, purify our hearts. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we confess any sin right now. We confess any sin that is blocking our relationship with our Father who is in heaven. We lay it down and we let go of it so that you can do your cleansing work in our hearts. We want to be with the God of our salvation right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your mercy upon our lives. You're so quick. So quick. So quick to turn to us, to run after us, to seek us out.
Galatians 6.14 says this, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It's an, it's an encouragement for all of us to consider what do we boast in? What do we lay our confidence in? Is it our hands? Is it our abilities? Is it, is it our skills? Are we really foolish to think that I made my own success with these two hands and God did not have everything to do with that? The sovereign God of the universe who created the heavens and the earth, you think he's not involved in the making of our lives? May we never be so foolish. I was thinking about this painting that's to my side here that Charlie started. I don't know if it makes Charlie nervous for people to see an unfinished painting or something in progress. But you know, sometimes we wait for the boasting until the job is done. When the masterpiece is complete, then we boast, then we praise God, then we thank him for doing everything. But how, how often do we, in the times of our lives, when the masterpiece has not yet been finished, when there's still a lot of work to be done, do we praise him and do we boast in him? Do we say, my God, thank you for letting me put down one stroke. I know I've got a lot left to do, but my God, thank you for that. There's a lot of unfinished business in this church body. In ministry, in relationships, in marriages, there is a lot of unfinished business. And are we going to be so foolish to have to wait till the end and say, well, I'm going to observe the finished product before I start praising God and before I start boasting in the cross? Or am I going to say, no, right now, he's with me. We praise him. Look what he's brought me through thus far. I know I've got a long road ahead of me. Oh, that's going to be painful. That's going to take forever. But I'm going to boast in the cross right now. The world says, what have you done for me lately? The world says, wait till you see the finished product, because that determines the value. No, the value is not is not found in the finished product. The value is behind the one who creates the masterpiece. That's what gives the masterpiece value. That's what gives our lives value. It's not how well we perform. It's not how quickly we get to the finish line. It's not how fully we comprehend things and figure everything out. The value is found in the one who holds our lives in the palm of his hand. That's why I boast in the cross. Because everything else in this world leads me to failure and disappointment and emptiness and unfulfillment. Father, would you give us hearts to boast in you right now? No matter where we are, in our life with you, in our walk with you, in our relationships, in our marriages, at work, whatever. No matter where we are, may we boast in you and in your cross. Because that represents the greatest victory and the greatest power that this world has ever seen. Father, may we never boast about anything else. Everything in this world falls drastically short of your beauty, of your power, your presence, wonder and your honor. Nothing even compares. And that 
nothing else hurts.
Spirit, would you magnify our worship in these last moments together? And keep our eyes focused on you, Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, the one who deserves all the attention right now, the one who deserves all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Thank you for today, Lord. We ask your blessing upon this week. That whether you have a great week ahead of us or a very difficult week ahead of us, we will boast all the more. That whether we have every need met or we have great wants, we can remember that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So for my brothers and sisters right now in this room who are hurting, who are broken, who are frustrated, who are angry, I want them to know, Lord, that it's okay. You don't think less of them. You don't look down on them right now. You simply invite them to embrace their weakness and their brokenness. That there are two things we are called to boast in. It's in you, Jesus, and it's in our weakness. Because when we boast in our weakness, we can realize that it's the power and the strength of Christ that lives in us, that gets us to where you want us to go. For when we are weak, then we are strong. Hmm. Thank you, Lord, for speaking us to, to us today. And it's in that beautiful, it's in that wonderful, and it's in that powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Hey, thanks again for joining us, and I hope what you heard blesses you, I hope it motivates you, and I hope it encourages you in your week ahead. And again, if you like what you saw, if you want to continue to, to follow along, please feel free to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And again, follow us, message us on Facebook, and you can also reach out to us on our website at fbcac.org. Thanks so much, God bless you, and we'll see you next time.